I am standing in front of the beautiful United Methodist Church here in Haskell, Texas. It has a beautiful stained glass window of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, who was born in 1703. He was the 15th of Anglican priest Samuel Wesley's 19 children. At the age of 17, John entered Oxford University, and in 1725 he was ordained and served the next two years, assisting his father as the parish curate before he returned to Oxford, where he joined and led the Holy Club that his younger brother Charles had begun. The Holy Club met every evening from 6 to 9 for prayer, praise, and for Bible study. They fasted Wednesdays and Fridays till 3 p.m., and in 1730, they began a prison ministry, denying themselves luxury so that they could help imprisoned debtors. Wesley gave all his strength to this rigorous routine, constantly monitoring the genuineness of his actions and of his sincerity as evidence that he was a true Christian. He recorded his daily activities, hour by hour, ranking his temper of devotion on a scale of one to nine. His highly disciplined holy club was disdained by the Oxford student body as a bunch of religious enthusiasts or fanatics and mockingly called Methodists. He regarded the contempt that he and his group suffered to be further proof that they were true Christians. He wrote to his father, Till he be thus condemned, no man is in a state of salvation. At the request of General Oglethorpe, who had founded the colony of Georgia two years earlier as a haven for English debtors, John and Charles sailed as missionaries to Georgia in 1735. On the voyage, a wild storm arose and snapped one of the ship's masts, and though John was the ship's chaplain, he could not minister to others for the fear he felt for his own life. But John was impressed and convicted by a group of Moravians who seemingly, without fear, sang songs and prayed. After two years of disappointing ministry in America, Wesley returned to England depressed and spent. But his life changed at a Moravian service on the evening of May the 24th, 1738. I went very unwillingly, he said, to Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change that God's work makes in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ alone for salvation and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins. Wesley continued with the Moravians for a year, preaching very little, as Anglican pulpits were close to him. In 1739, his friend George Whitfield invited Wesley to join him, preaching to minors in the open air. At first reluctant, Wesley finally acquiesced, and God blessed so powerfully that for the next 50 years, Wesley preached in churches where he was invited, but he preached in fields and halls and homes and open marketplaces when he was not. Wesley believed that the Anglican church was failing to preach repentance, and many of the people were dying in their sins just as he had been, including many of her clergy. Wesley believed that God had saved him and commissioned him to call a people to a personal relationship with God through repentance and faith in Christ, and nothing could be allowed to stand in the way of that call. Wesley soon realized God was blessing them with so many converts that he and the few clergy cooperating with him were inadequate for so great a work. So by 1740, he began approving and appointing men who were not ordained by the, Amer the Anglican Church to preach and do pastoral work. While the Methodist Church in America, still a sect of the Anglican Church, declined during the Revolutionary War because of their loyalist tendencies, following the war, the Methodists, Presbyterians, and Baptists spearheaded the Second Great Awakening on the Western Frontier. Though he was never ordained a bishop in the Church of England, Wesley continued to commission laymen as preachers for the new Methodist congregations and as Methodist circuit riders in the wilds of North America. And when, after the war, the Anglican Church would not ordain a bishop for America, Wesley commissioned Anglican priest Thomas Coke and Francis Asbury as superintendents of the Methodist Episcopal Church in America. When John's brother Charles begged him to stop, stop taking such authority to himself, lest they be kicked out of the Anglican Church and destroy their reputations forever, John replied he had no intention of separating from the Anglican Church, but he must save as many souls as he could while he lived without being careful about what may possibly be when I die. In defending his ordination of laymen, Wesley said, Beware you be not swallowed up in books. An ounce of love is worth a pound of knowledge. And by his death in 1791, just three months shy of his 88th birthday, Wesley had lived to see God bless his life and work so greatly 
that not only had tens of thousands of souls been saved, but the Methodist Church had become the largest and most active Protestant denomination in America. And over the next 70 years, the Methodist Church would go 300% faster than the population of the nation. And though the, today the denomination has lost much of its evangelical fervor, along with many of its members, the Methodist Church played a major role in the prosperity and the progress of the United States of America. Another way to stop it here.